Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 249th New Social Environment. I'm Catherine, Director of Advertising here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation between Jana Levin and Paul D. Miller. We're also very lucky to be joined by poet Bridget Hawkins, who will read to close today's program. Sam Riviere, who was originally going to close out our program, um, was unable to join us, but he will read at a very near future date. Um, so thank you so much, Bridget, for being here. To begin, I ask you to join us in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. We recognize white settler colonialism as a part of the continual legacies of white supremacy, which has been which has many contemporary expressions. We honor the memory of those that have lost their lives to those and to those who are working to undo this legacy of violence and injustice. We acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. And please check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Um, and now to introduce our esteemed guest, Jana Levin is the Claire Toe Professor of Physics and, and Astronomy at Barnard College, Columbia University. She is also the Chair and Founding Director of the Science Studios at Pioneer Works. A Guggenheim Fellow, Jana has contributed to an understanding of black holes, the cosmology of extra dimensions, and the gravitational waves and shape of space-time. Our host, Paul D. Miller, is a composer, multimedia artist, and rail editor-at-large. He makes works that immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. Um, and without further ado, Paul, the mic is yours. Um, first and foremost, hey, everybody. And once again, uh, Catherine, Nick, uh, Fong, and all the Brooklyn Rail crew, it's a pleasure to see you guys. Um, and I just want to acknowledge today is International Women's Day. And um, as a heterosexual African-American male, um, I just want to say salute and power to everybody. Um, you know, it's, we all have to, I think, acknowledge that, that we're in a struggle for remapping and, and recalibrating so much of the issues that the legacy of the 20th and 19th and 18th centuries has left over the discourse. So with that being said, it's a pleasure and honor to uh, dialogue with one of my all-time favorite women scientists, um, uh, Jan Eleven, and we have a friendship that's gone on for a while. She's friends with other friends of mine, like Mitchell Joachim. And there was a wonderful collective in Brooklyn that we, I believe we first met in one of those crazy after hours parties that was in the, um, who's the gentleman? Totally. That, yeah, who passed away recently. Um, Al. Yeah, Al, yeah. who was also. Awesome. Alatara. Yeah, so do you wanna just do a quick, I wanted to ask, I have so many questions. I wanna, the light bulb moment is like, you are a unique figure in the ecosystem here in New York and globally. Um, and for the audience, you have to remember, usually my motto these days is scientists don't know about art, artists don't know about science, and musicians don't know about anything. So we have to um, try and always um, sort of raise the level of discussion to get everybody on board, because science is the most crucial thing of the 21st century, hands down. Our species is at a really, I mean, it's either Trump or science, you know, it's like that powerful of a moment. So mm -hmm. Jenna, I just, I've always wanted to ask you, what made you you? Like, because you have a really amazing background. <laughs> Uh, um, that's, do you wanna, that's, yeah. yeah, that's really sweet. Um, I have to say, I've been marching towards this unique position of being the director in sciences at Pioneer Works. I feel like gradually my whole life. Do you know that feeling? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I did not st start life in, with a chemistry set in the basement. I, it actually took me a while to discover physics. So I've been, it's like a pendulum swing. I went from thinking I was going to study philosophy and art to being like, whoa, physics. <laughs> and math and then that's all I cared about like I was at a point in philosophy where I was so tired that everyone was trying to figure out what some long gone philosopher meant when they said you know some prophetic quote and it was driving me bananas and then I discovered physics and then I became so extreme the other way because nobody is going what did Einstein mean mm -hmm. right nobody's saying that he can it's hard but you can be taught it you don't even have to know his name. You don't have to know where he came from or what culture he grew up in. It's simply true. And it's true for all of us. 
And then that swung back a little bit, you know, well, what is meaning? How do we understand science as meaning? And what is art? You know, and it's just become this sort of trajectory to think that culture is important and science is part of culture. We were joking right before we went, we went on air that the only equation I have behind me, I'm actually in my college office and this wasn't a plant, it was actually here. Mm -hmm. um, this is Einstein's theory of general relativity in essentially one sentence. And from this, there are techniques to like unpack it like some crazy origami and derive the big bang and black holes and you know all that stuff and and there's something just very both beautiful and powerful about that and i and i think um i think to make a very long trajectory short it just is natural to me that we all grow up as artists and scientists there's not a kid in the world who isn't exploring the dirt and testing things and theorizing about the world and who isn't drawing it's just who we actually how we started you know, yeah. I, but I actually wanted to get to the the biographical, like where you grew up, how that influenced, yeah. you know, like were you both your parents professors? Um, oh, did you play yeah. did you play soccer? I, you know, like kind of <laughs> some of those biographical things that, that linger over your, you know, as your mind creates these, these vistas. Um, sometimes yeah. it's those grassroots that let people kind of get a good sense of who you are. Totally. So my, my dad um, was was probably very scientifically is is very scientifically minded, but growing up was was very conversant about it. And he's he's a he's a doctor. He's a uh, uh, he worked a lot in ERs with with pediatrics and in and it was quite intense. Like I don't know if people know pediatric doctors who work in ER rooms aren't always the most cheerful. <laughs> and uh, but but there was just like ability to talk abstractly about the science that would sort of you know ground him we wouldn't really talk about cases because I think they were quite heavy for him and uh but my mom was like the reader so I don't know I've got uh let me show you uh, I hope I can yeah. set this up again one time so I have like a little bit of a bookshelf situation <laughs> <laughs> that's a like classic college professor bookshelf but mm -hmm. in my mom's case um she had like this really modest bookshelf and i realized at a certain age that if you peeled back the first row they went like four deep <laughs> right so it's like this one single column but they were like Whoa. it was like having a wall and she really taught me to read and i don't mean like sound out phonetics i mean she taught me how to value reading you know like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and like starting with all the greats in that era and so when I was around you know in my teens I, I discovered books which I wasn't like a big reader before then mm -hmm. and then I was voracious and so these were this was just natural I think you know and that's like that's so like I see that as so fortunate not everybody has that kind of access and exposure and it's not in it's not in school right it's about like love and passion it's about like personal identifying with 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 that material and what the meaningfulness and, and and how it helps you navigate life you know so so i think those collisions were always at like these two forces for me you know do i become a writer do I become a scientist do I become a writer do I become a scientist? and um i don't think my parents expected me to do either i mean i remember when i started physics my dad was like what <laughs> Like, are you sure you want to do this? That looks pretty hard. Right. <laughs> you know? He'd like pick up some of my really technical books and be like, are you uh, really? <laughs> this looks kind of intense. Like nobody really got it. Mm -hmm. But where <laughs> um, was this? Like what, what part of the country? So by that, oh, I grew up in Chicago. Okay. In the city I, or like downtown or? Well, both. When I was a little kid, we were outside the city. And then like 11 or so, if I have that right, um, uh, we were downtown we were living pretty close to like water tower place downtown like right on the classic american city divide between like stunning and complete poverty <laughs> we were right <laughs> literally on that block <laughs> so like in one direction we had this like beautiful view of like the Gold Coast, literally what it was called in Chicago. And out my other window, right up against us was the alcohol rehab, YMCA, drug and alcohol rehab, you know, naked mm -hmm. men drying themselves off at like 30 below weather on the fire escape like that. It was just like classic Americana. Right. Um, terrible. I shouldn't be laughing about it, but it's still like that today. We all know it's still like that today. There's literally often one block 
and that's the markers, you know? So I, you know, I grew up in a very like rich, but it was also such a great way to grow up. Mm -hmm. I mean, my friends from all over the city, you weren't limited by your school, right? We had friends all over the city. We were city friends. We were Chicago friends, different schools. And, um, and you know, musicians, so much music and so much art and like, and like, Midwesterners are like real salt of the earth people, you know? So there's this sort of like down to earthness, even though it's really this great like architecture and this sophistication, it's also, there's a real, yeah, salt of the earth quality to it. So, so that was Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I hardly go back ever. I haven't been back hardly ever. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting thing because for me, at least, when I think of you, I've always thought of you at the heart of this sort of cosmopolitan swirl. You always have been very, very generous, both with your students, um, also with the, the Brooklyn Collective uh, that Al uh, had set up. What was that, you know, and like, there's this kind of component, usually one imagines mathematicians and scientists as isolated figures. And to me, at least, you're, you're, you're potentially being a mentor to an entirely different view of how science and the arts intersect, uh, which, um, I mean, I remember when, I kind of have a fog, you remember when we first met, I believe it was at that, at that space that Al was doing. What was the I name of this? Yeah, what was the name we, of this? We space called was? it MEX, capital M, capital uh, E, uh, small X. So, mm -hmm. so and it was on Atlantic Avenue, right? Or no? Um, yeah, uh, Flatbush. Yeah. Flatbush and Ave. So it was a very special place. I, I love talking about Mex. One day I'm going to write the story of Mex. Um, mm -hmm. So it was Al Atara, who passed away recently, um, just over a year ago. It's this crazy guy who owned this building right on Flatbush Ave, near like Barclays, Atlantic Avenue sort of area, Nevins, Fort Greene, you know, but, but like pretty deranged block. If you walk it now, it's still pretty deranged. And he was a hoarder. He had the seven story building and he just filled it, but with amazing stuff. He had like this enormous table that seated like 40 people that once was in Grand Central Terminal and somehow he got in the building and, and it would be just tilted on its side up against old bars and saloon stuff and incredible furniture. He was a hoarder of the highest caliber. So the first couple of floors were these crazy floors full of stuff. If you needed something, literally, if we were going to a party, we could be like, hey man, you need a jacket. <laughs> we walked around the building until right. we found a coat rack which would be populated with different sized jackets. It was, it was almost magical. Um, and Al sometimes charged money for people to work there as artists, sometimes didn't. But he also sometimes would fix things, sometimes wouldn't, like the skylights would fall in and the rain would, or the snow would be coming in and he wouldn't want to fix it because he would want a more creative solution. He didn't like just fixing it. It would have to be, you had to figure out some solar system where you were going to grow something. You were going to mm -hmm. take the spill off of there. So, what he attracted was this crazy collective of a lot of really techie people, a lot of really great artists, a lot of um, kind of media lab style makers and, um, and this spontaneous collective erupted, I would say on the seventh floor, we were on the top floor and some absolutely the most remarkable people I ever knew. We all had a st shared studio up there. It had no walls, it had no dividers. We would kind of, you know, roughly call it a hundred square feet. And, um, and th th people would be welding, sparks would be flying, you know, crazy stuff would be happening. Mm -hmm. And people were making the most glorious things from huge installations for Bjork, or, uh, you know, you mentioned Mitch Joachim and Terraform to artist Andrea Lauer, who who's, does a lot of like Broadway and fashion design and set design and just incredibly bizarre, eclectic. Um, Jessica Banks, who's a roboticist and uh, uh, entrepreneur. And, you know, and there I was, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this little setup that was like a cat, like it looked like an old Beckett set that I found from the hoarding. I would just go around and be like, hey, Al, I found this really cool like 1920s couch. Can I, can I put it in my space? And I assembled this totally bizarre looking, looked like a Beckett set, 
is all I can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only less minimalist, less min. It looked like I don't know somewhere between a Beckett set and an Ibsen play. I don't know. And um, and it be and I was just there to write. I was doing a sabbatical from Columbia and from Barnard, and I wanted I was finishing a book, and I would just kind of like lie on the couch and just be in this with sparks flying, you know, things happening. It was just so inspiring. Yeah, it was um, a very magical spot because you had yes. a lot of interdisciplinary people doing their thing, and it was yes. freewheeling. And just for the very audience, um, it was very Brooklyn before Brooklyn is now Brooklyn. It's kind of, it was like a mega mix. And the weird and cool thing about it was mostly science geeks, but they would throw parties where the drinks were made by people doing like biohacking. Um, there was one guy who was focused on like, the, yeah, alcohol. yeah, the molecular structure of strawberries mixed with some crazy molecular tonic. Um, totally. You know, so everybody was a mega science geek and it was really, everyone was very open and freewheeling. And the guy, mm -hmm. Al, he would walk around with a huge beard. And, yeah. um, huge white you know. beard. He looked like Santa Claus. He had calloused hands, like one hand. It looked like a baseball glove. It was so big, you know. Right. You, and you guys do a great party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Al was um, wonderful, wonderful, yeah. intense man. We never thought Al, we would lose Al. He yeah. was just this, this crazy and also, you know, tough tough guy and um and and offer you know many people tried to buy the building from him for 20 30 million dollars and he just he thought this is this is what value in life is mm -hmm. is having this crazy collective and yes we had gen space before gen space moved and became a more sort of official place mm -hmm. gen space the sort of citizen science biohacking um group was in that on that seventh floor mm -hmm. so basically off our kitchen we had a genetics lab <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, these are these are all things that if you're if you're an artist right now what's fascinating is many artists are pivoting to stuff like nfts which stands for non-fungible token and over the last couple of weeks you've had everything from gamestop where these people were trading gamestop on um uh you know crazy like 8chan and stuff like that but you guys were math geeks in a playful way and i always found it very charming but this yeah. over the last couple of weeks math has really become part of the, the dialogue for art because so many artists have pivoted recently to trying to sell their work as tokens and tokenizing. And so when yeah. I say tokenizing, for anybody in the audience who's not familiar with that, it's, it's applying a cryptocurrency logic to the way your artwork gets received. So you have a unique blockchain signature. Again, all of this becomes mathematical and the art is, uh, is generated with a unique signature that um, is, is blockchain uh, based. So Jenna, let's I just want to pivot for a second. Go ahead. No, no, no you, please, you, go ahead, Paul. So no, I was just gonna say, I've been trying to, learn about that too and it's pretty confusing stuff i've been trying yeah. to like get more fluent in that whole blockchain nft and it is like i am trying you know i don't want to be left in the dust <laughs> when there's well, a new currency but it's interesting uh, yeah a lot of people are applying complexity theory to it and complexity and of course astrophysics have kind of quirky overlapping things about scalability large scale mm -hmm. um yeah. and of course one could argue the universe itself is made of information so that the waves spin and you know whether something's spinning up or down a lot of people have been saying that the universe is just information which makes me which brings brings me to a question i've wanted to ask you um so by the way audience we are being graced by one of the world's leading specialists in black holes um and i've always wanted to ask you are you a fan of christopher nolan because it seems like he's cribbing from me. um especially with like uh with interstellar if any if anyone in the audience saw the film interstellar i think there was a lot of you in there um if you want oh, to riff on so that for funny. a second i have some stories about that okay so that's mm -hmm. very flattering but i think who's really in there is kip thorne who is basically one of my mentors mm -hmm. so kip thorne won the nobel prize just a few years ago for his work on black holes and uh kip was was somebody who's very special to me. He's a Caltech professor, you know, uh, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on the colliding black holes and recording the, literally the sound of space time ringing, playing it back in an auditory way. I mean, just totally remarkable stuff. And I'd known Kip since I was really a kid coming up in astrophysics and I'm not gonna deny he was one of the only people who was truly kind to me. And so I've always had this absolute affection for Kip. And we've stayed friends for many years. I just spoke to him on the on the, the Zoom like we're doing a few weeks ago. And um, Kip wrote the treatment for Interstellar with his ex-girlfriend, who is a powerhouse producer, Linda Obst. 
and she produced Contact, if you remember that film with Jodie Foster. Yeah. Yeah. And the amazing thing was one of the first films where science was like central in the narrative. And Linda is responsible for a lot of that. So she is one of the producers from Contact. She's done so many things. Good Girls Revolt, if you haven't seen it, awesome show, <laughs> completely undervalued and underrated that Linda produced, all the way through to Interstellar. So mm -hmm. Linda and Kip were connected. And mm -hmm. I was at a party at Kip's house um, for Stephen Hawking, you know, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Chris and Jonah Nolan. So there's a light connection of being in the same sphere. I would say it's very flattering of you to suggest that Interstellar is from me, but it's really from Kip. Although Kip told me that the equations that they used to render the black hole that he, he told me, I don't know, if I really held him to task to find out it was true because I kind of just wanted to believe it so much that I didn't want to investigate. But he said he uses my variants of the black hole equations uh, right. for, for the for the computations of that beautiful black hole, which is extremely mathematically accurate. Right. A lot of um, people are saying that the black hole and the, at this, that was one of the central pieces of the film was mathematically accurate. Um, very accurate. So what yeah. happens is like if you imagine there's the black hole. And it's surrounded, imagine like by Saturn's rings, a planar disk of very hot stuff. It gives the illusion that the ring is above the black hole as well as below the black hole because the black hole distorts the space time enough that the path of the light looks like it's coming from above and below. It's a mm -hmm. complete lens. It's literally like putting it in a funhouse mirror. And so it creates the illusion that the disk is above and below the black hole. And you see that rendered very accurately in Interstellar. So considering that you have that Einstein equation behind you, I want to show the audience one quick photo that's <laughs> resonant with what Jana was just saying. And to me, at least, when you're hearing this kind of, Jana has this tendency to kind of, um, her conversations are multivalent. That's my nickname for it, because you can go in all these different directions. And valence, of course, is a physics term as well. But I will always want the audience to remember that um, I think a lot of her work is inspired by these kinds of um, dialogues in a cosmopolitan setting that she then has a very rigorous approach to math. So one of the things that struck me when we, over the years, as we've been kind of going back and forth with science and looking at what you're doing at Pioneer Works, mm -hmm. is that this is an early collaboration. I just want to show the audience. Einstein, um, this is a very legendary Bengali poet, Rabindranath Tagore, who's generally considered one of India's premier poets. So Einstein, whenever he was working on a math equation, would go and play violin. And he was quite, um, when he would get a writer's block or an equation block, he would go just start riffing. One of his favorites, of course, was Bach. Um, so they're backstage when they both are winning. Speak, Janet had just mentioned the Nobel Prize. I just thought I'd show this. They were backstage at the Nobel Prize Awards and Einstein was pacing and very nervous. Um, mm -hmm. So they got into a conversation about music and math. And uh, Reverend Dr. Tagore was like, ah, you got your Western tuning system. So Einstein's like, yeah, I play violin. And uh, Tagore was like, yeah, the violin, you know, your tuning systems are all messed up because you guys didn't have zero. Uh, we in India, we've had two, zero for much longer than you guys. So we have microtones, all these overtones. If you ever hear a sitar versus a violin, you can easily hear there's a tremendous amount of complexity. So they ended up getting into a correspondence and they made a book together called On the Nature of Reality. It's about the way that the universe is a tuned system. So that leads me to Jenna. Um, I just, I, what, I, your recent series of books are all one of her most famous concepts is black hole blues, um, which I'd love to, if you want to, can you riff on that for an, from an artist's well, perspective? Well, first I have to thank you because literally you introduced me to that. So this is one of the funny things is I, I tend to be like, this experience I had of not liking to, looking in the past with philosophy mm -hmm. became almost a pathology, right? Where it's just, <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't need to know, you know? I need to look forward, 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 math, math, math. And so, but I also then love it when you introduce these like romantic moments that actually I didn't know about, you know, that's incredibly lovely. But um, you're asking about math and music. It was that the question? Yeah, or, well, black holes and tuning systems, because like, uh, uh, yeah, the space time continuum is tuned. Yeah. Uh, string theory has tuning kind of resonance, yeah. resonance theory, all sorts totally. of stuff. Totally. So, so it turns out that a lot of systems are similar. And it's really cool. So, so the first book I, I wrote was called How the Universe Got Its Spots because the mathematics at work in determining why there are hot and cold spots in the light left over from the Big Bang is the same math that's at work in biological systems that determine how the leopard got its spots. And so it wasn't just like a cute 
knockoff title. It was literally saying like, this is the same mathematics. You solve a Laplacian and you have certain boundary conditions and it's on a certain shape. You know, so the shape and size of the universe determines the pattern of hot and cold spots left over from the Big Bang in the same way that the shape and size of an embryo um, determines whether the flowing enzymes create a specific pattern on the animal's back. And that's why animals have certain patterns. And I, that just like blew my mind. And one of the people who noticed, he wasn't thinking about the Big Bang, but noticed that about this biology of the leopard spots was Alan Turing. Mm -hmm. And it's the, per, it's, it's the fluidity of the concepts, right? It's like you can surf these concepts into all kinds of different arenas. And so Turing, um, in thinking about the leopard spots, realizes a certain gen, you know, generic thinking. And, and, and you know, he is one of the most exceptional thinkers of the past century. Um, complete oddball, you know, troubled, not all his fault, largely society. Um, you know, you opened the conversation about thinking about, you know, homage to people who, who, who didn't all have a fair shake in life. That, and weirdly Turing, who is one of the most influential people in all of our lives, he conceived of the computer. He made it in his mind. And that's why, you know, some people, um, either joke or it's uh, one of those urban myths that the apple with the bite out of it in the in, in the logo for, for, Mac, for Mac computers and Apple computers is a reference to how Turing committed suicide because he uh, laced an apple with cyanide and took a bite of the apple as a also also for him a reference to Snow White. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well back to Turing. Right. You know, it's the so, idea so that what, these concepts what are Black universal music? and you can you can cruise these concepts like spaceships to different worlds. And mm -hmm. that's what I love about, about math and physics. You can take these concepts like spaceships to different worlds. They, they, you don't leave them behind, right? They're vehicles to go like anywhere. And, right. and that's something Turing did really beautifully with math. But okay, so you, you've written that black holes have very specific uh, tuning stuff going on, like B flat, mm -hmm. uh, which is also the yeah. root of blues. A lot of blues yeah. in B, B flat. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you want to riff on that for a moment? Because I think the audience would well, really benefit from that as well. It's funny. I am very musically unskilled, but I have, I have created a musical person. My son is extremely musical. My husband's very musical. My son is very musical. I like to think I gave my son a little kick of like a little extra mathematical analysis to add to the intuition. Um, they're, they're both pretty vir virtuosic players and they play a lot of blues and a lot of jazz. And, um, and they're also extremely adept at just a huge variety of like different genres and like voraciously eating them. <laughs> And then like, you know, burning them metabolically into something new. Um, but with the black holes, in my case, in my particular work, I was very fascinated with the concept that when two black holes collide, they act like mallets on the drum of space time. Space time rings. Now to, you know, people start to quibble, oh, they ring in, in the vacuum and you can't actually hear anything in the vacuum. But technically it's, it's, it's not proven, but it's conceivable that if you were unfortunately close to the collision of those black holes, it would actually ring your, your ear mechanism. And even in the vacuum of empty space, you would hear those black holes collide because space was squeezing and stretching and deforming your ear mechanism. And it happens by coincidence that if you get two black holes in the range of 10, 30 times the mass of the sun colliding, it's in the human auditory range. <laughs> it's just the frequency happens to be in the human auditory range. The instrument that won the Nobel Prize when we were talking about Pip Thorne, that's called LIGO, happens to be tuned to the same frequency range of the piano. Hmm. But the idea is that the black holes collided 1.3 billion light years away. And by the time it gets here, it's way too weak to ring the human auditory mechanism. It's like playing an electric guitar without an amplifier. You can't hear it right. with the human mechanism, but you plug it into an amplifier and it comes back to you as sound. And that is literally, LIGO is like a musical instrument in that way. It's like an electric guitar. It rings in sympathy with the ringing space time. 
it's too quiet for us to hear. And they plug it into a conventional speaker in the, in the control room and listen to the output. And you can listen to these black holes ringing by listening to, um, to the amplifier, augmenting it by something like 10 to the 21 orders of magnitude, which is you know a trillion, uh, uh, a billion trillion, roughly times louder, it needs to be for us to hear it. But you're, you're at a really interesting cross section here because the, the beauty of that is that scalability, like your average human lifespan is between 70 and 80 years. The earth itself is four point, you know, is uh, 4 billion years. Uh, yeah. The universe, uh, there's a pretty broad overview that it's about 13.8 billion years. So you imagine yeah. a song that's playing over 13.8 billion years. Like how would yeah. you, and your average human, that boggles the mind, like you, you, a sense of scale. Like we can't even imagine a tuning system that would encompass billion years or the sheer volume of gravity that's being distorted by a black hole. Um, so well, these like, are things, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, that's why I became so obsessed with the project. So when I wrote Black Hole Blue, so, so my, last book, Black Hole Survival Guide, is much more just like black holes, man, it was just black <laughs> holes. But Black Hole Blues was about the insanity of the ambition of even trying to understand the score that goes along with the universe. It was really about the, the, the like Mount Everest climb and how improbable success was. And even while I was writing that book and I was talking to Kit all the time and talking to Ray Weiss and Barry Barish, um, all who won the, that shared in that Nobel prize, Ray said to me a month out of the discovery after devoting 50 years of his life to this project, he said to me, if we don't detect black holes, this thing is a failure. And that was how I got the title. It's the black hole blues, you know? <laughs> like it, this man had put 50 years, billions of dollars. He said, if we fail, we have led this country and other countries down this wrong path. And the weight on him, like I felt it when he was talking about it. And it was about a month later that the um, instrument records. They, they like, people make it sound like they turn on the machine and it worked. It was already 15 years in and it hadn't heard a damn thing. Okay, hadn't heard a damn thing. And, and uh, after all these years, and they were upgrading to the advanced instrument and they weren't even ready. Uh, they, were, they were literally banging on the instrument trying to see if it was working. They were doing things like driving alongside. So, so LIGO is this huge like antenna, if you imagine this huge L-shaped arms. They were driving down the access road, slamming on the brakes to see if it would throw the machine out of lock where it couldn't detect anymore. And it, in the middle of the night, exhausted a bunch of like you know all these postdocs all these scientists working through the night in different sites put their instruments down and decided to go home and within the span of an hour this um this rippling in the shape of space time which had been traveling for 1.3 billion years or more or you know roughly a give or take a few hundred million uh right. i think about like just a multi-celled organism were just dividing on the earth <laughs> right when it well, left its origin and it washes over and gets detected right let it's me show everybody like, i just want to visualize that for a second here everybody yeah. so what janet was just saying this is a, a map of acoustic waves and i'll zoom, zoom in so a wave for example that can take place over one to a couple million years would be a global wave oceanic cycles geologic cycles um, if you scroll down a little bit to months, a waveform like our seasons, for example, we just had that crazy cold snap in mm -hmm. Texas that's caused by the collapse of certain air currents. Um, but that's a cycle. Again, these are all cyclicity, periodicity, and you know, a wave is just a fluctuation. So the earth itself is yeah. made of waves, the patterns of the weather, your bloodstream, everything Jan is just saying, our body is made of these kinds of things. And if we scroll down to some of the smaller frequencies, frequencies that take place on the smaller waveforms, uh, you keep going further and further down. Um, you can get to cyclones, you can get to planetary tides, the way the moon shapes the, uh, the tidal patterns. So we're living and breathing in all of these things that Janet was just talking about. But from the viewpoint of an artist, it's really fascinating because some of my favorite artists like MC Escher, for example, uh, of course, uh, over the last couple hundred years, Da Vinci, um, it was the 500th anniversary of his drawings and stuff. But um, people like Galileo or Johannes Kepler, 
they're all tied into what Jenna was just saying. And we're now in the 21st century. Uh, Jenna, this is something I think you're really uh, kind of a clear cut, um, kind of, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, like sort of cipher for this, because you pull together all of these different variables. Um, her books are very lyrical. And if you guys haven't had a chance, um, if Catherine or Nick, you could maybe post about one or two of her books. Jenna, so what, just by way of uh, transition, what are you working on now? Um, I'd love to hear some of your current projects. And I know the pandemic time, we all have a little more time than normal. Um, what's going on? Um, so it looks like we've actually lost Jana. Maybe her connection oh, okay. cut out. But if you want to keep talking about the waves you were just discussing while we get oh, her sure. back on. OK, I'll wait until she. Um, so yeah, everybody, what I was kind of showing you was these are waveforms. And if sound is nothing but a waveform, um, your body, the cells, the atomic particles, uh, are, we're based on a sort of physics of presence. Um, literally, um, if you keep di di digging in, you know, the, the, in, in the ancient Mind Indian Hindu mythology, they say, what does the world rest on? And they would say, oh, the world rests on a turtle. And then, then someone would ask, what does, what does the tur turtle rest on? And they say, oh, well, wait a second. So the nickname for that is it's, it's turtles all the way down. And so um, to the, you know, basic fabric of space time and so the funny thing is um, certain cultures have got that as a metaphor, especially India, which where the concept of zero was invented. And most of our numbers, uh, whether it be one, two, three, four, they come from uh, Sanskrit uh, that the Arabs appropriated and turned into Arabic numerals. And that didn't reach the West until Fibonacci until like, you know, several many, many centuries later. But I do want to just say uh, science and space, uh, many of the issues that Jana has been talking about, she's been highly influential on in a lot of um, science thinking. And one of my favorite heroes right now is this woman who you're going to see in a moment. Um, this is Octavia Butler. She's a legendary African-American science fiction writer who's been highly influential on the thinking of quite a few scientists. In fact, the, the Mars Perseverance lander that just landed on Mars, they named the landing site after her. Um, so today is Women, International Women's Day. I just want to make sure to kind of be respectful of the fact that so many women have never gotten the full um, I think credit that they were due in the sciences. Usually you had, you know, boys with toys. Um, and it's, you know, so I was gonna sort of riff with Jenna on some of her issues of the way she's kind of thought about the intersection of science, art, and her perspectives um, so from some of her recent books. But um, she's, amusing enough, she was dialing in from her cell phone. And I think the signal was funky up at Columbia, you know, <laughs> Columbia University, uh, bad cell phone signal. Um, so until she comes in, I'm going to just kind of take the torch here. And some of the stuff that I was riffing on about her work, um, from my perspective, comes out of this, this sort of legacy of the way the interdisciplinary arts of both the Middle Ages and Renaissance then affected how we thought of both the Industrial Revolution and then moving forward. It was all about scalability. Um, if you looked at certain parts of history, especially in Europe, um, Galileo and Johannes Kepler are the best examples. Um, they were almost burned at the stake because they had said that the earth, um, you know, rotates around the sun. And to me, what's powerful about that from the viewpoint of the arts is art was going through a revolution at that time as well uh, because of perspective. And people were able to really create what they call zero point perspective, create more and more dimensions in their paintings. And above all, the way math and physics at that time were very, you know, in a proto, you know, sort of proto form. They weren't really as formalized as we think of them now. But, um, you know, the, everything is pattern recognition. And I was really happy to hear Jana talking about that. Um, from my perspective, one of my biggest heroes from that is a gentleman, uh, Johannes Kepler. And Kepler was one of these quirky scientists that um, basically he was doing science as we think of it before it was all formalized into the distinct sections that we have now. Um, I think Jana's back. I see her. You might want to unmute uh, Jana if you can. And um, basically, I was just going to use this Kepler uh, kind of scenario here because basically he was on his way home in the middle of a snowstorm um, in 1611. And if you see, um, you know, stuff like both the Italian futurist and the way that we think of um, art, science, and technology right now. Um, here, I'm just going to show you guys this very quickly. And it looks like um, we've got Jana back with us. Right. Sorry about okay. that, Paul. Yeah, no worries. So this is a very famous painting from M.C. Escher. And if yeah. you haven't seen this, it's just a classic sense of how these kinds of involutionary perspectives 
uh, kind of derived from the many of the science issues that Jana was talking about. Jana, I'm just kind of giving the audience a little bit of background while we were waiting for you to jump back on. So okay, from, cool. from, from MC Escher, I mean, you can easily see he had a physics approach and was highly influential. Mm -hmm. People like, you know, various scientists, and especially at the beginning of the 20th century, mid 20th century, were highly influenced by his mode, mo you know, multiple perspectives. So too yeah. with Picasso, for example, um, mm -hmm. and the Italian futurists were thinking about sound in, in the city. But when we're looking at black holes and other interstellar phenomena, these are at such a huge scale that we really haven't been able to, we're still at the beginning of it all. So Kepler, um, like I said earlier, Jan, then I'm gonna pass the torch to you. Um, he was on his way home in the middle of a snowstorm in 1611 and a, a snowflake landed on his sleeve and he was stunned by the precise geometry in nature. And uh, he went home and wrote this essay, which I have right here. It's called Six Sides of a Snowflake. And mm -hmm. it's generally considered the first sort of notion of geometry and nature condensed into a very specific mathematical form that it was highly influential on sort of thinking about nature and, and math. Um, so this essay, um, he actually formalized the way snowflakes uh, generate, you know, come on, coming out of temperature differentials and become very geometric. And again, nature and math have this deep, um, Brian Greene's most famous book is The Elegant Universe. So there's, there's a lot of um, overlap with the visual arts and the sciences that Jenna was talking about. So Jenna, anyway, there, I just gave the audience a little um, tangent there. But um, so well, you got well, awesome. Yeah. You can riff like that. I I warned um, Brooklyn Rail friends that that might happen. Really big apologies. <laughs> I'm having like the whole um, yeah internet web thing's been against me for a couple of days. I'm taking it very personally. My computer okay. died. My iPad doesn't connect. My phone is batteries. And you know, it, it's it's one of those comedy of errors. Um, but but. Uh, just to pick up where Paul was was leaving off is is you know I do really believe that the mind inherited mathematics through evolution, and that's why we have math in our minds. That's why we can discover it in our minds. I mean, how insane is that that I can look down at a piece of paper and learn something about the beginning of the universe? That's bananas. And the reason why that's possible is because I believe evolution has allowed us to inherit those structures. And, um, and they are literally in our neural networks, you know? And, um, and we're, we're, we're like mining the inside to learn about the outside. I mean, it's something I think that's very special. So uh, one question I had wanted to ask you is what are you working on now? You're always coming up with either a new book or are you, she's like hyper productive. I'm, I'm always stunned at how you're able to juggle all of these things. Um, any new, what's your new current book or project? Yes, yeah, you know, you know the ups and downs of mania, right? You know, don't, <laughs> it ain't all bad. Um, also, Paul, like I wanna reverse some questions to you in a second about music, but I'll, I'll answer that one because I am really excited about what we're doing now is we're doing basically Pioneer Works Virtual, which is the broadcast. And it has been a labor of love of mine and behind the scenes for a while that was sort of, I don't know, underdeveloped. I couldn't really get a lot of people to be excited about it because Pioneer Works, as um, many people know, is a cultural center in Brooklyn. And that's why we love Brooklyn Rail also. You know, we're really in this local experiment together. And, um, and it's very much about live events. And that's how the science studio started. You know, science is part of culture. We're gonna be in this cultural space. We're gonna do live events. We're gonna have parties. We're gonna have 800 people, a thousand people. It's gonna be great. And then uh, I was working on this. Well, we're, we should be sharing this, this, this stuff. And, um, and then COVID hit. And this idea that I, you know, a handful of us have been working on, you know, obviously Dustin Yellen, one of the founders and Gabriel Florence, one of the founders were all thinking about these things, but all of a sudden COVID hit and it was no longer in the back burner. It was suddenly urgent. And so the past year we have frantically been producing what we call the broadcast, which is the Pioneer Works virtual. And you'll see us launch properly in a couple of months. Right now, we produce a lot of articles, a lot of video, a lot of content. Um, we love it. We're super excited about what's coming out. We have articles with Richard Dawkins, with like different scientists, with different artists. Um, Brian Green was one of our first uh, videos that we put out. It was a conversation with Brian Green, who you've mentioned just now. Um, and uh, but in a couple of months, you're going to see us launch our full kind of expression. It's it's really going to have all the disciplines 
represented. And so, so that's what I'm working on right now. Okay. I'm editor in chief. Uh, so okay. that's like that, that's my day job now. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, my day job is still this. <laughs> <laughs> That's my well, let's let's unpack that because the, these are all very intriguing nuggets here. So Pioneer Works is its own entity, but you're also coming out of Columbia University, a very highly, very specific uh, academic scene. And how how did you and Dustin uh, meet and begin to this kind of this scenario? Because Pioneer Works is a very unique uh, part of the New York ecosystem as well. Yeah, it is. But they're all connected. All the things you've mentioned. So Alatara and this crazy, totally anarchist space mechs, which had no structure, no board, no financial relationships, you know, uh, nothing like that. We, a lot of those artists ended up in the new lab whose mm -hmm. CEO is David Belt. And David Belt right. is a wonderful per powerhouse. And, um, and so a lot, what happened is basically that studio, specifically our, our floor on the seventh floor, uh, broke into two, but uh, many people ended up going to the Navy Yard. And, and that's really much more of a maker space, you know, and I'm, I'm more like just in my head. So I didn't go. And that's what's really interesting is because now David is one of my closest collaborators, which is kind of one of those ironies, is I ended up deciding to go to Pioneer Works at, when, that, when that split happened. And oh, okay. so they're all connected. The Navy Yard, New Lab, Pioneer Works, MEX, they were all part of this growing trajectory. And so Pioneer Works was in some sense, at the time, uh, this beautiful blank slate for me, an opportunity to create something, but I didn't have all those people yet. You know, I didn't have all those, um, yeah, those individuals. It was more, more a very different kind of, I'm gonna establish a, a spot. I'm gonna, uh, you know, terraform some land here, turn him, turn it into the science studios. So I met Dustin and Gabe, uh, Gabriel Florence um, in that transition when a bunch of people went to the new lab and I started to, I was invited to Pioneer Works to meet them basically. Okay. Well, you've been able to, I mean, the thing that I think you are one of these really powerful avatars for is interdisciplinarity. And that's something that a lot of artists are facing as we move further into a digital context. And we were just talking about NFTs, non-fungible token, that's what it stands for. Um, do you have any thoughts on math and, and the arts coming together a little more? Or are, they, are there any? Because, oh, I think it's inevitable. Yeah. I mean, you know, imagine the time before art got political. I mean, I mm -hmm. suppose it was always probably a bit political, but in a more naive way. And remember <laughs> the era. I don't know. I mean, Paul, you know much better than I do. When people started to think, oh, you know, art is a really serious way to discuss politics. Mm. And then, and not to, like global politics, like what's going on in colonialism, what's going on in Africa. And then it became a really serious way to discuss like individual politics. Like, you know, I'm an individual in this society and I'm not being represented. And it became a tool, right? right. Um, a weapon. And, and, and each sort of motivation creates with it its own character. And I think eventually, I mean, of course, science is going to come around to be fodder for art. Of course it is. Right. And the question is really just how it's going to manifest in the hands of the different artists. And that's why we love artists. You know, there's this individuality in the way that they use those tools and express those tools. Um, but what I love is it's, it's a very positive, right? It's not this like anti-science, which can happen and, and can be valid. Um, I usually argue that most of those things that people feel is like very anti-science is usually not really science, like the terrible <laughs> history of the way, you know, black men were treated with syphilis uh, used as for experimentation. That's not being scientific, right? Mm -hmm. That's just being uh, horrible. <laughs> no, well, genocide, racism. But yeah, how, that's, how not, that, that's not the scientific impulse in that moment. Um, but, okay, but can we can we can we take patriarchy and the notion of how for centuries women were sidelined a lot of their I mean if you look at Ada Lovelace if you look at other women who have been powerful contributors they were never given that proper you know this is the yeah. rock star moment here they would you know um, right. I think Ada Lovelace is just as important for computing as uh, Alan Turing for example right. um, because without her he wouldn't be able to exist I mean she she was like generally for the audience she's considered one of the inventors of software. Um, her and Charles Babbage created what they call the difference engine, which was mm -hmm. a really important sort of computing device that was like powered by steam, which is totally mm -hmm. wild. You know, yeah. so these, these are all things where women 
And, um, you know, people of color, there was a controversial moment, of course, with climate um, denial, where this one lunatic Republican, I can't even remember which lunatic Republican, mm -hmm. but they, the guy said, like, you know, what did people of color con ever contribute to civilization? And um, this, is a, this is a grown adult. And, you know, you're like, yeah, it's incredible. Like math, uh, you know, early physics, uh, most of the Greeks took from various, you know, whether it be Eratosthenes, which I'm never sure if I pronounce that right, and who's in Libya. You know, he was uh, he was Arab Greek um, and so on and so on. So, you know, these are all issues where I think I'm hoping the audience can kind of think now is a time where we're, these tools like science as Jenna is practicing it and looking at these mm -hmm. interdisciplinary approaches, they're, they're giving us better tools for critical thinking. And that's where I think the Republicans are deeply in fear of that. But one of the main things that's going on is they're defunding a lot of public schools, community colleges. Um, there's a critical dimension where America, like school used to be free. I mean, your average kid now is going to a university that's kind of a, the university is a small, basically appendage of a huge hedge fund, you know? So <laughs> yeah. um, like Harvard is oh. basically just a small school attached to a huge hedge fund, you know? So, no, it so, isn't. You know. it, is, it is absolutely criminal um, to see not, you know, I don't, don't want to get into the school system. It's not my area of expertise, but I, I, I live it and it's, um, you know, both both New York City public schools, New York City private schools, and it is horrific, horrific what feels like the lengths people will go to to have an exclusive community. And that is not how society progresses. Alan Turing, who, how many Alan Turings have we never heard of? Right. Um, but there's a great just of, of course I take your point and it is devastating, but it's also like interesting to me the human desire to contribute. I, I rarely write book reviews, but I wrote a book review for the New York Times that was a joint review of a book by Davis Sobel um, called The Glass Universe and Hidden Figures. Mm -hmm. um, which of course was made into a movie. And the reason why they were related uh, was because they were marginalized groups of scientists and um, Hidden Figures became a much more famous story, but the, the Glass Universe is also a fascinating story of a group of women who worked at Harvard. Um, they were called Pickering's Harem. And it's very <laughs> interesting because people, Charles Pickering Incredible. was- yeah, was the director of the Harvard Observatory uh, turn of the previous century. Right. Um, and, um, and he fired all of his male astronomers because he felt that they were inadequate. And he said something, <laughs> and it's impolitic, but he said, my Scotch maid could do a better job. And indeed, he hired his Scottish maid, who was Wilhelmina Fleming. Wow. And Wilhelmina mm -hmm. then collected a bunch of women who became... Pickering's harem. Now it's very interesting to me, and Paul, this is like a whole conversation about how it's being sanitized. People yeah, are like, wow. you can't say that anymore. You can't call it Pickering's harem. It's like you have to call it. Pickering's <laughs> you that have to be... understand what they were called. It's part of the history, right? right? I mean, it would be highly on PC for our time. They'd, right. they'd have and to get Governor Governor Cuomo would have to say something about it. <laughs> so you know, these but, women lived you know, penurious well, lives. They mind were, blown. Yeah. Some of them were going blind so from poverty. Some of them were going, like literally going deaf from poverty and right. um, they could barely support themselves, but they made these very significant contributions to astronomy. And it's the reason Hubble, after whom the famous satellite is named, was yeah. able to discover that there were other galaxies out there and the universe was expanding. He used the work of, of Henrietta Leavitt and her peers in Pickering's harem. So, yeah. yeah, there are these great, great stories. Imagine how many stories <clears throat> there are like that. And don't forget, even the, the current new dean of, um, of MIT is a woman, and that was shocking. She's the first woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Sumners at Harvard made the in, you know, infamous comment, why aren't there more women scientists? I'm sure you remember that one. I do. Um, I, um, Larry, I've I, I met him I at know. Aspen Ideas. He came to a lecture of mine at Aspen Ideas Festival. Yes. And we, we had, a, it, you know, I was like, what was, you know, what are you thinking? What, why were you, you know, just what would go through your mind when you would <laughs> say that? Yeah. His wife is a well-known poet and she, you know, I'm sure, you know, she has a show on PBS about poetry and the arts and we, we he, he was cordial, I was cordial, but you're in Aspen in the mountains and you're end up talking, I was like, you know, and also he had this whole beef with uh, Cornell West. I'm sure you've heard about that one, but they won't give him mm -hmm. tenure now at Harvard. 
Um, so these are all things that are like shocking and it's well, still not. I sort, of, you know. I sort of feel that Larry Sumner was set up in the following sense. You don't right. ask a dude who's a bit outdated to set himself <laughs> up, but you don't give right. him a load. Of, like I, you know, yeah, it was time for everyone to update their opinions. And I guess it was some mockery of like, I'm going to expose these guys for what they really think. But I do think he was a bit set up for right. that. Okay. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying <laughs> it was set up. Somebody was like, it's just too easy to hand this guy a loaded gun and he's right. going to just shoot himself in the foot. You Definitely. Know? That was a real shock. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, considering we're here talking about art, I do want to uh, make sure because mm -hmm. we're going to be respectful of time. It's almost two. So, Jana, one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Here we are where, where we have billionaires like Elon Musk um, trying to colonize Mars. We have Jeff Bezos is now one of the, you know, all these guys made so much money in the last year during the middle of the pandemic. But they're all based in math and they're based Actually, a lot of them look at complexity theory, many of the like emergent complexity. These are things that are resonant with what you're up to. Do you yeah. feel that um, more uh, there's going to be a more fine, like overlap between these kind of complex fields, math, physics? Because a lot of people are using physics. Even recently, the, the insurrection on uh, January 6th, they hired a guy that, that looks at interstellar phenomena and complexity to track the cell phone signals of all the people who were at the insurrection. Um, because they made a crazy map of all the cell phones moving and they could actually look at it as like a, a swarm, like murmuration. Have you ever seen um, birds flock? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which again is very mathematical. Yeah. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as we, because we're going to have to like open up to questions a little bit. Where do you think the near future is? Because literacy is a critical thing that Americans, scientific literacy, um, people like science programming is like being cut on a lot of stuff. We're looking at a crisis of education. Obviously, I'm hoping Biden, Biden's wife is an educator. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts of like the recovering from Trump years or moving forward? Because uh, yeah, any thoughts on that? Well, it's so many questions <clears throat> at once. And also I have to apologize because in my hysterical catastrophe of gadgets, um, my phone might die. <laughs> so just giving you a heads up, uh, okay. Paul might be doing the Q&A on his own. Um, I'm hoping not, <laughs> but it is one of you. Um, so yeah, I do. Th I actually think, Paul, it's a really critical question. I think we have to stop calling people who have less access than us idiots. We have to stop it. And we have to, I, I almost think it should be a requirement for people who are going to go do a PhD in math and science, that they spend a year in a part of our own country where science education is not what it should be. And um, and that should be like a requirement or six months or something, a summer, I don't care, mm -hmm. some civil service, because you cannot simply scoff at people who don't have the same access as you and, and, and leave them behind and think there's not going to be consequences. And so how do you engender, how do you reach the Trump, forget Trump, how do you reach his <laughs> base? You reach his base by stop calling, you know, some people are unreachable if they're QAnon. Right. Yeah. But that is really, there's a lot of people there who are reachable. And it is not right for us to have like impoverished parts of the country, um, you know, largely in the South and stuff like that, <clears> where, <throat> where, where we're condescending. And, you know, you have to start thinking about why did they like him so much? And, mm -hmm. and, and how are we going to, you know, not address like white supremacist ideas. Okay, like, let's start like, but not with that. But how are we gonna address like young people who are growing up in that climate, who, who aren't, who are, aren't hardened yet and, um, and deserve, deserve access to science and to math and to, to stuff that transcends boundaries, right? To stuff mm -hmm. that's true for all of us. And right. um, we can't simply say you and all of your progeny for the next several hundred years are written off and unreachable. That's not fair and it's not right and it's not true. And if you look at why Barry Barish won the Nobel Prize alongside Kip Thorne, I would say largely it's because he understood the power of science for the, you know, for the community, like making a collaboration, <clears throat> an international collaboration. And he reached out in Louisiana where one of the LIGO sites is outside of Baton Rouge. He reached out to the local communities. He started education centers. It wasn't condescending. It was inclusive. And, you know, and I think that's really, really important and, and, and something that we, I don't hear anyone talking about. 
you know. Okay, so let's unpack that. I mean, from my personal, I grew up in Washington, D.C., near DuPont Circle. I don't know if everybody um, knows D.C., but the, what, what got me into physics was amazingly of Dungeons and Dragons. You had to calculate, like, if you got hit with an arrow, like, if your chainmail armor would be able to withstand, or if somebody hit you with a sword. So my I, professor, uh, Barwick, uh, who I still stay in touch with, I mean, um, Charles Martel and him, or, or if anybody knows Fringe Seminary in D.C. or Woodrow Wilson, they're, they're actually, again, they're going to change the name of Wilson because it's controversial. He was racist and he was an asshole. So they're, they're, they're changing the name. But um, so after school, we'd have physics class where he would, we would do Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons with, you know, calculating like 20 sided dice, stuff mm -hmm. like that but it made physics fun and you had to kind of think mathematically about every interaction in the game. And, mm -hmm. um, and that made it fun. So there's a lot of ways that I think we can rethink how science is taught. It just, I mean, I'm lucky in the sense that it was fun and I got in, I majored in macroeconomics by the way. And I, that, so that gave me a little bit of math <laughs> background. Now it's not every DJ that's majoring in macroeconomics, I can tell you, but um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's always a Next kind time of- Next um, time I interview you. <laughs> But um, I'm a huge fan of Jana's work mm -hmm. and I know time is ticking, it's 2.05. So if I know her cell phone might die, do you got Nick and uh, Catherine, do you guys wanna just do a quick thing for the questions and stuff? Because time is, you know, her phone is seemingly gonna, gonna have some issues there. Um, I'm gonna try to solve it while we talk. Okay, okay. great. Well, while we have um, Jana, thank you by the way, Paul and, and Jana for this. Um, our first question comes from GE. Um, GE, I can pass you um, a mic now to voice your question. Thank you, and thanks for this wonderful program. It's been it's been heady and amazing and, and energizing. Um, so, what, who now in art and literature and music besides you, Paul? Um, are best incorporating science into their practice. Oh, wow. That's That's a whole that wave. Pick it up on. Yeah, there's a whole wave of science, of, of artists doing science and scientists doing collaborations with artists. Um, probably the most, two, if you have Jana here, you have Brian Green. Brian Green's done collaborations with like Philip Glass. Um, uh, there's up at Harvard, there's a couple of people. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, the, there's... Why am I blinking? There's, she's Lisa friend, Randall. Though. Yeah, Lisa Randall. Um, there's a Brazilian physics guy at Dartmouth, which I'm blanking on his name. You know him. him I think him and Lisa used to go out even. <laughs> um, he's Brazilian. Um, oh, he I know what you mean. Marcelo Glazer. Marcella. Yeah, Marcelo Glazer. Yeah, uh, Stefan Alexander. Um, Stefan Alexander, he's a jazz musician. Yeah, mm -hmm. he does jazz. He has a book called The Jazz of Physics, which is quite, mm -hmm. uh, quite, quite sharp. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the visual arts, there's a lot of artists using math and algorithms now. Um, in fact, it's overwhelming. I think there's going to be an entire generation of people looking at algorithmic art. Um, and especially now that people are making a lot of money. I mean, over the last three weeks, like, like I don't know if you know the music of Grimes. Uh, she's, she used to go with Elon Musk. She's this quirk. She, has, she looks like goth rocker from the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, she just sold like a song that you can get for free on the internet, you know, for $6 million using an NFT, you know, kind of blockchain right. thing. Right. So a whole bunch of artists like really pivoted very hard over the last two weeks to, to blockchain art. So you'll be seeing a lot more of that as well. Um, I hope yeah. that answers the question, but there's a lot of people going in that direction. Yeah. And there's also people doing unusual things like genetically editing a butterfly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so like smaller scale stuff. And I think people are beginning to understand that the palette includes biology and math. And, um, and uh, my dear friend, Leah Halloran, I wish I had a copy of my own book, along with my technical fails. <laughs> I have like real life fails. Like I forgot to bring a copy of my own book. But my dear friend, Leah Halloran, who's a really interesting artist who thinks a lot about, and she's the one, just like you, Paul, you know, taught me some weird history about like Einstein and poets. She taught me about Pickering's harem. And um, <laughs> as an artist, she went to, to Harvard and worked with the glass plates and did a whole series about those glass plates um, that those uh, women were using. So it was a particular photographic technique, an astronomical technique. Um, so there's, you know, there's people who are thinking really deeply also about their own process. There's stuff that Paul mentioned, which is super high tech. 
And then there's people who are going back to the super low tech, like how are those glass plates made? And using the sun to expose photographic plates and things like that. So she did the illustrations for my book, which is why I mentioned it. She, she right. um, they're not really illustrations, that's unfair. They're artworks and they're paint, they're original paintings. And it's- um, By the know, way, I have the, the Kindle yeah. edition of your book. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. um, I, if, if it, folks, her book is called Black Hole Blues. This is like a classic. If you don't you know, I don't. I got rid of physical books. You can see. I, in, in fact, I just moved, and it was, it was such a relief. I felt like liberated to not have physical stuff anymore. But everything's in storage. And if, actually, I was just at Mercer Street Books because um, I donated a bunch of my books to them, um, and they've been selling like crazy. So one, of, I have the physical book of yours is at Mercer Street Books, and then the digital one. Okay. I have. Yeah, um, and I just, I'll show you guys a funny uh, thing. And Fong, I sent this to Fong as well. Um, the, the owner of the bookstore is quite happy. If everybody sees this, this is just the other day. That's many of my books are now at Mercer Street Books. Um, I just wanna encourage everybody um, to, to go. And uh, they've been selling like hotcakes. They, they're like a bunch, and a lot of my vinyl too, I donated to Mercer yes. Street Books. Um, so those are like a whole bunch of racks of my books are there. So if anybody, um, wants to uh, support local bookstores. There's, they have a really cool selection now. So <laughs> really sweet. Um, Always yeah. support local bookstores. Well, I did the same thing. I, I moved all my books out of my apartment, but mm -hmm. I couldn't quite leave them, so they're here in my office. Yeah, it's it's yeah, so the, so. You guys, um, Catherine and Nick, do you want to have more questions from the audience for Jenna? Yeah, um, Jenna, how's your phone battery doing? Ten <laughs> percent. 10%. Let's okay. Go. Um, our next question comes from our very own Fong, um, the captain of this ship. Fong, you should be able to have a mic now. Thank you, Jana. Thank Hi, you so Fong. Much. Hi. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I have to leave soon for a meeting, but I absolutely love what being discussed here and, and Dustin is a, a no friend and we have planned to collaborate anyway, piano, mm -hmm. piano you know, a pioneer work in the rail. Mm -hmm. So definitely that's something we must mobilize as soon as the pandemic comes to an end. But mm -hmm. uh, yes, Dustin should come on to talk about what is potentially in our collaboration and whatnot. But in terms of what being say here, Jana, I remember, uh, decades ago, reading Caroline Merchant's book, remember the death of nature, woman, ecology? Mm. And, and I, I realized it's the opposite of what being done uh, in terms of male scientists. <laughs> I, I just feel like what, what the horror that we have heard and read about um, of the Manhattan Project. And I remember reading um, La Ernest Lawrence confession too, when uh, when when he retold the story when Oppenheimer came in the office of Truman, who gave the thumbs up for the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and he basically said that I have blood in my hand, you know, I felt compelled to do it and whatnot, and Truman threw him out the office and saying. Blood is on my hand. Let me worry about that. So the reason I'm 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 paraphrasing that remark simply because there's a tradition of this history. It began with the great, one of my favorite poet, visionary, philosopher, um, namely um, Giordano Bruno, who was born at stake in Rome, the 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 at the Campo di Fori in 1600, sometime in February who were burned at stake because he denied the, the truth, the re real existence of Trinity, the idea of divinity of Christ, along with the fact, scientific fact that the earth moving around the sun and it's had, the earth had a soul, you know? Right. So, so Galileo survived because he was friends with Medici, whereas that guy got burned. So there you right. go. <laughs> right, that's right. In fact, Gal Galileo uh, alive, but nevertheless, they, you know, uh, uh, Descartes didn't come to rescue him, you know? So that's another incredible memory. Right. We know all that history. My point is leading, let's skip to the most crucial part, which is early 19th century when the Industrial Re Revolution took 
prominent in its historical form. Mm -hmm. uh, we know Cartesianism leading up to Newton developed right. at the expense in the service of the, the British Empire. No more, no less what happened to Oppenheimer and you know, Ernest Lawrence and so on. My right. that at some point, somewhere, the trust became incredibly eroded uh, between the scientific community who lent their scientific research to the government. So the government took ownership of the invention mm -hmm. and knew what they, they have been doing, which mm -hmm. is destruction, you know, of all form. Uh, so how, how do we go about it, Jana? In t I, mean, well, I, I love the idea of artists and uh, you know and scientists collaboration. There's been a tradition. Is it enough, Paul, Jana? How, mm -hmm. in which way we can mobilize to make science a little bit more accessible um, and more um, clear, you know, to to the attention what everyone is doing. I know that you've been doing a terrific job. I loved your interview with uh, Siddhartha. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Watch the other night, and yeah. and and yeah. What way mm -hmm. can we do even more so? Well, so I think there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, I think we're all, you know, products. I don't want to say the classic of our environment, but we are, and and it's a very heavy charge that all of us should somehow be able to do what nobody before us has ever been able to do, which is to completely transcend their environment. I mean, there are things that I thought 10 years ago that I'd be shocked by now. And I think one of the things we have to do is also stop vilifying everybody and everything. And mm -hmm. if we're going to really talk about being inclusive, we have to include people who we don't agree with. Being inclusive doesn't mean as long as you agree with me. Yeah. And um, and I I think uh, we all have stuff to learn. We're gonna look back at we where we all are, where we think we're so, you know, progressive, and we're gonna be shocked at at where we are. Our kids are gonna be like so, and their kids are gonna be so way ahead of us. And so what we have to do is. You know, again, the pendulum swing. I mean, I'm, I'm not really declaring what we have to do. I don't really mean that. I want to be clear. I am not a social theorist. It is like my weakest subject. Well, I'm much happier just calculating well, Einstein's equations. Well, I don't want to pretend to be good at something I'm not good at. But if well, you ask me intuitively, what am I concerned about? I think inclusivity really must mean including people we don't agree with. And that's like a first step. And to also be a little humble about you know what, none of us are as evolved as we should, you know, none of us are fully actualized people, none of us are like mm. that, you know, we're all on a program, a pilgrimage, and, 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 and we have to lock and load, not the notions, but the process, right, right, the process, like why Turing's process can be used in multiply different ways, why it applies to the leopard spots into the universe. Like the pro like just stop being so attached to the conclusion and a little more to like mm -hmm. understanding, hey, I can reapply the same thinking here and yeah. I can use this thinking here and look at works. Yeah, um, I, I mean I, I definitely not asking for solution, but I yeah. love I really um, love your you know idea of inclusivity because mm -hmm. we have suffered so much on that chasm, you know, yeah. if you look back to the age of enlightenment, Paul and I talk about this too. So if you had the, the, the canonize of scientific base that made into a foundation for human progress, say, yeah. you Locke, you know, Voltaire, Rousseau, but and then you have the, the opposite also equally important, whether it's William Blake, whether Goethe, whether Coleridge, Novalis, kids, and so on, uh, and we know that same thing during this, the you know throughout the history, in the you know leading to the end of the the the, uh, the Cold War too. Uh, the yeah. point is right now, having seen that photograph of Einstein and Tagore, that's a good example of mm -hmm. cross pollination of two different minds who yeah. could really actual 
have a conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Einstein played violin, as Paul pointed out, and Tagore had this amazing idea of different pedagogy. That his mm -hmm. school is very identical to Black Mountain College. So he thought the idea of colonial school was simply producing robot, robot, the robot-like factory worker that fit into colonialism anyway, which is mm -hmm. the idea of the West um, school base of pedagogy, you know? Um, so, so my point is that, yes, inclusive is important. Mm -hmm. and how, how, what can we do more of it? I mean, we, we the Rail and Pioneer Works will definitely collaborate, but mm -hmm. how can we make that even more so? Mm -hmm. Horizontal. Well, you know, hold on, Fung, but I want to try and get it between what both you and Jana were saying is that one of the most famous and well, I think, regarded philosophers of the 20th century was the science philosopher Karl Popper. And he wrote a series of books and essays about democracy and science, but his most, he actually helped coin the, the phrase uh, um, uh, conspiracy theory because he, he was trying to figure out in the 1950s um, when people would run with information but not have the correct or verifiable or looking at scientific method. So um, his book about the crisis of democracy and science helped popularize the term, which we now, of course, with fake news and other things. So QAnon could be like a, um, an anti-corollary for what he's talking about. So um, it's really, I think right now we're at a crisis where like the notion of re realism, you know, which again, in art is very specific. Like when people think about, you know, uh, is this a painting of a hand? You know, there's a very famous Magritte painting, Ceci n'est pas un pipe, you know, un beep. And um, so he's got that painted on, the, on a blue sky background. But Karl Popper would want to sort of analyze that and say, what is the representation of the pipe? One of my favorite books, and this is where Jana has, I think I, it influenced my thinking about her quite a bit, was Godel Escher Bach, um, where um, they compare different approaches with music and loops and layers, um, you know, and there's got to be, I think, a, a, a good common ground where we can kind of get people to think of science as fun. You know, that's uh, burning half of Burning Man now. I used to DJ Burning Man. I don't go anymore, especially with the pandemic. But, um, you know, the, the guys, the executives from Google would jump out over an airplane over the festival, you know, and it's like, that's math, you know, these guys are doing their thing. But it was always a sense of humor about um, fun. And I think that's where Jana was starting at Mex, which I, I use that as the beginning of the conversation, because that was an interdisciplinary venue. You had mm -hmm. scientists, you had, you had Bjork coming by, you had a guy making molecular, you know, gin and tonics, with, you know, crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. And it right. made it fun, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, Paul Popper fled Nazi Germany from Austria to England, London, mm -hmm. for that similar reason that Einstein left Germany and ended up in Princeton. My point is when Oppenheimer detecting approach is not quite true, he never knew whether Nazi Germany is develop, you know, developing, there's no proof for their developing the atomic bomb. I mean, when he went to FDR, proposed that you, we must do something to create the atomic bomb before Nazi Germany would do it. You know, he gave the permission in end of Truman's, who gave the permission in the end, it took several years to accomplish it. My point is that there's no proof. Just like no more, no less, there was nothing um, develop in Iraq. You remember that led mm -hmm. to well, But here's, but Fong, here's yeah. what might be part of what, you know, Paul's describing and also you, you, you're describing, you know, people going to the Institute for Advanced Study. Right. That is something civilization did spontaneously, which, which was to create the Institute for Advanced Study. Now we could, which, which was, unbelievable in terms of its creativity. Now we can now sit back and criticize, well, it was private, it was in Princeton, it was largely white, it was all men. Yeah, not perfect, but a real step in terms of thinking in the moment, what community can we invest in yeah. that is just intellectual, just artistic, just creative? And that's what Brooklyn Rail is about, certainly what Pioneer Works is about, right? It's what Paul's engaged in in so many different tentacles. And if our community just keeps getting better, that's what we can do. Like, I really do believe that, you know, this whole principle that we have, 
free and open to the public to have a more creative and inspired world. Those aren't just words. We talk about it all the time. Dustin, yeah. Gabe, and I talk about it all the time. That's Are we? True. Is this a, going to create a more open and inspired world? Are we going to solve real problems this way, right? So community, even grassroots, small scale Brooklyn, like Princeton, like the Institute for Advanced Study, these are important ways that that I think we engender progress. Right, and so that's where I think Jenna is a really good sort of uh, touchstone for this. And again, sorry to keep going back to Karl Popper, but his book, The Open Society and Its Enemies, which is a, a classic of thinking about science as a tool for after the post-war situation for making a better footing for democracy in the face of all these totalitarian situations. And he, he, he was very passionate about science and democracy. Yes, and he was. Very interconnected. Um, and I think and that that's, a, that's a good call. So mm -hmm. was Milton Russell and leading to John Dewey, even though mm -hmm. Dewey was less of a proponent advocate of science, he certainly thought science can be part of his philosophy of education, which is what we are trying to retool, reconstitute. What once work was during the Great Depression, the, the Federal for the Art, that's exactly what we are looking at back now, but the the one you know essential part of this, Jana, is science. Mm -hmm. So that's where we mm -hmm. are, we are desperate at the rail to find mm -hmm. way to welcome that essential part of it, which is mm -hmm. a scientific community, yeah. because yeah. we believe in one point when the Renaissance developed the idea of humanism, it was all integrated, you know, and that's what saved. Uh, the tail end of Black Death that gave Renaissance the, mm -hmm. the meaning of rebirth. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think we might need to go back to that philosophy. <laughs> you know? Well, but, we're, we're we're doing a digital update of that. That's where it's oh, like. Not uh, so bad. You know. Thank you, you guys. I'm, yeah. I'm I gotta go now. But Jana, merci beaucoup, and I will be in touch with you super soon. Paul, lovely. Oh, merci Jana. beaucoup. Ciao. All right, good soon, Paul. But you guys. All right, so. Nick, Catherine, do you guys, have, is there any last pressing questions? And Jenna, I do want to just say thank you for your time. I know time is a precious, scarce resource. Oh, totally. um, and it's thank been you for fun. making the change. Yeah. But I, would, um, I do want to, I, I do think it would be more graceful to hang up before my phone dies. That's a good, okay. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jana, for your, your generosity today. Your energy totally. is um incredibly inspiring um Thanks, so Catherine. much to think about today um and i hope there's a part two somewhere down the line definitely um, we'll get we'll get dustin and gabe gabe in next okay amazing um Great. have a Go wonderful ahead. afternoon jana thank you thanks thank so you. much bye all right bye jana bye paul thanks bye right. jana bye <laughs> Bye, Paul. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Oh, and people can can write me questions on Twitter. Okay. If they oh, didn't get to ask their questions, ask me on Twitter. I'll do my best. Okay. okay. Awesome. Bye. All right. So, um, with that said and done, thanks, Jenna. Let's um, let's just uh, what any pressing kind of conversation anyone wants to have about Jenna's work or what's going on or, um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm I'm flexible about time frame. I I should have to wrap up shortly, but. Um, Nick, Catherine, you guys want to moderate any other debates, yeah. freewheeling discussion? So um, if you'd like to take a stab at one question we got in the chat from Lavender Suarez, um, they asked, what are some of our big, our understandings around the auditory qualities of the Big Bang? Um, and to maybe specify on that on audible low infrared. So if you want to take a stab at that question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So just by way of preferencing this, I'm a writer, artist, musician. Jana is a specialist. So she's like Miss Black Hole Space Time Continuum. That's so I read voraciously and I, I'm very well familiar with her work and other work. So my answer is going to be qualified by the fact that I just want to make sure to preface this. Um, so basically, sound requires things like, say, for example, if you ever see, I don't know, Interstellar, the Christopher Nolan film, or even like his more recent film, Tenet, which is about forward and backwards time, there's a whole series of issues around the way um, we think about dimensionality. And sound, amusingly enough, we still aren't sure how many dimensions it moves through. Um, so for example, right now, you guys are seeing me on a 2D screen, existing in a 3D universe, unfolding in a 4D 
time. You know, it's, it's so as we think of those, there's a very famous book called um, Flatlands, a, a Romance of Many Dimensions by Edwin Abbott. Now, amusingly enough, if you were to go to interstellar space, sound as we know it wouldn't exist because there's no oxygen molecules to carry the waveforms, but there is a significant amount of hydrogen throughout the universe. So sound waves wouldn't travel as they would here on our planet. Um, a lot of science fiction movies get that wrong and they'll make, you know, like if you're hit the Death Star, if you're Luke Skywalker or something, there's a big boom, you know, that would not happen in space, but it looks cool. So people generally have applied the metaphor of that sonic event, like an explosion and a boom and a loud sound and stuff. So over the years, that has come to sort of significantly affect the collective imagination of space, um, which is, it's wildly wrong. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, what we're seeing now is that there's different approaches to how sound can work. So for example, there's a, there's a whole field called um, data sonification where they'll look at a spectrum of light waves and anything that's a wave form actually can be a sound. So sunlight is both a wave and a particle. Um, space time itself, actually the fabric of space. And there's literally a term they're called the fabric of space time is made of things like quarks, which then if you go further and further into you get to what they call string theory, so all of that is vibrating and resonant. And so there's actually sound at every level of this uh, universe, which is pretty fascinating. There, there's a great book I'd love to recommend by another specialist. Uh, his name is Stefan Alexander. He wrote a famous book called The Jazz of Physics, where he looks at tuning systems in jazz. Um, and he, he's head of Brown University's uh, quantum physics department, if I remember correctly. So between Stefan and Jana, they could answer your question filled with academic footnotes and all the math equations. I just gave you the Cliff Notes version, but um, you know, hopefully that answers the question. Um, I, I read a lot, so that's, that's my take, but um, I'm sure if there's anybody who's a specialist in physics in the audience, they could probably give a more specific uh, answer. Um, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I think this is a beautiful time to move to our closing poetry reading from Bridget okay. Hawkins. Um, so obviously at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our lunchtime conversations with a poem. Um, and today I'm very happy to welcome our poet laureate Bridget Hawkins to the stage. Bridget Hawkins is a New Jersey native currently completing her final year in NYU's creative writing MFA program. Her poem, Anemic, was winner of the Academy of American Poets 2018 College and University Poetry Prize. And her piece, Tell Her Anyway, is featured in the Simon & Schuster anthology titled, It Occurs to Me, I Am America. As a biracial Black woman living in America, Bridget's poetry often confronts issues of race and marginality, engaging in a range of forms and genres. Um, Bridget, I am passing you a mic now. Hi, um, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to read from a poem uh, called The Virgin and Mother. Um, so one, mom is reading her book in her room, still a teenager. What does she dream of? What encompasses the workings of a private thought in the confines of a room? Nothing can intrude but obligation. Sometimes I dream about what would have happened if she had said no, taken her own path. This is what they wonder about children, but never about her. Mom is granted. She holds up her hand as if to say, please, not before I finish my book. But she is already pregnant, and such things are in motion. And my mother told me once that she never wanted to be married, have children, or settle, and yet. Mom is red haired and pale of skin. They offer her a lily, which is death, and she cannot take it. Her stare is vacant and my own. Some days I opt not to eat because I need the control, not to sleep because of the nightmares. Maybe this is mom's curse too, to stare forever half missing and wholly concerned, to be between now and eternity. I wonder if it was ever not lonely for her in the earliest days when she could feel the baby kicking the inside of her uterus. It seems a lonely making thing, making a thing. In a moment, it could be dead and unmournable. And perhaps this is why they offer her the lily. Eke, eke, mom says, which means, look at that. Look at that. 
Look here, look, I am a virgin. I am filled with loves complicated in place of lovers. And it all competes for my hatred in a game I can only lose. I will never kiss a man and I do not think I mind it. Most days I am slumped into a pile on the center of my bed, wreathed in blankets to fight the chill. I offer this prayer so my mothers can hear me, so my mothers can see me, so my mother can be me. Mother, Mary, hear me. Two. Mom looks at her child with exhaustion, a little man already, and she knows that his person will outpace hers. Why do we take for granted that mothers love their children when we know that fathers hate theirs? This thing grew inside her like a parasite, a worm, present without consent, ripped its way out. As a child, I always went to mom over my father, and I still do, but what resentment that must build over time to be constantly the one to solve, to care, to hold up the weight of the living child against your chest. I wonder if sometimes mom ever went off privately, told us children to handle ourselves for a moment and ignored the dishes, found a book again for a day and tried to make things like they were before, even if they never could be. Today, mom dresses in black because she is always mourning. She is stalked by lilies, and I think this is because they whisper to her. In their hollow centers, they hold out all the regrets that unsettle her and make her eyes lower. In the morning, mom texts me to make sure I am still alive. She is still holding me against her chest with both hands because I am still an infant in her arms. She paints the walls of her house brown, orange, green. She says it reminds her of nature. In her text, mom says, thinking of you and praying for you. I never know what to do when praying. I sit in the pew, close my eyes, and put on a serious face for the audience. Sometimes I make my face seem sad or dire, which is a strange thing to need to perform because most days I do feel sad and dire. I do not understand the formality of the thing. I do not understand bowing in the dirt. Sometimes when I am running late and everything in my life is on fire, I start laughing and I lounge out on my furniture, enthroned. When I am in great despair, I giggle. I say to God or whoever else that they're being a real dick making things so difficult for me. I think this is my praying, like when I call on the gods of things, like the God of the broken shower and the God of the edge of the bed where I stub my toe every morning. I am elbowing a real God in the ribs, like I do with my mother when I'm telling her I'm going to become a spree killer, teasing, because wouldn't it be so much easier if things weren't so vague in life and all I had to do to earn an easy ride was sacrifice three goats or pray a novena. Why do mothers have daughters? Why did my mother? Raised with so many sisters, I would have assumed she would be sick of women. Some days I am. Mom looks at me with an infinite tolerance and I regard her from within and without. Here I am, child. Here I am, virgin. I am not certain of the lines between us, but I am certain that there are lines and that they are impenetrable. On Monday, mom texts me, leaving work now, are you heading out to class? And I ignore her because of this look, the sweep of the eyes across the child. It feels like a minefield of constant disappointments. Hours later, she writes, is your class over? And later again, she writes, are you okay? And I can feel the panic in her as though it were in me. And it is somewhat sickening to be doubled in this way, constantly to be endless, to be filled with repercussions echoing. And so I write back, I'm fine. That's it. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was a beautiful, beautiful way to end today's program. Um, and thank you, Paul, uh, for bringing together today's conversation. Um, a reminder, if you had a question for Jana, you can tweet that at her and she'll answer it. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions and comments in the chat. Um, this, real, this year marks the Rails 20th anniversary. We are a nonprofit organization. So if you enjoyed um, today's event, please consider making a donation to help keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant and independent. 
Um, and we hold these events every day. So please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation between Jackie Nickerson and Charlotte Kent. And we will conclude as always with a poetry reading from Jasmine Carr. Um, and now I invite everyone to um, turn on their mics and say goodbye as you leave, if you wish. Um, thank you again, and we'll see you soon. All right, and by the way, thanks everybody. Jana is amazing, and this was like a real pleasure to see. And don't forget, seriously, she's very good at getting back to people. Um, her Twitter handle, I think, is at Jana11, if I remember correctly. And just Catherine and Nick, thank you guys too. So it's uh, these are really important sort of catalyzer conversations about science, art, and the near future. So I'm hoping, um, you know, I just love doing this with you guys. So yeah, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Uh -huh. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bridget. Hi. Thank you. And thanks, Bridget, too. Yep. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Bridget. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Paul. Great, Great poem. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been really a wonderful conversation. Appreciate appreciate you taking your time today, Paul, as always. Yeah. All right, you guys. So we'll talk soon. Stay safe, wear a mask, and uh, you know, always good to catch up with everybody.